know if you have ever done a search for the return of Jesus on the internet, but I did that this week. And you know, the, the most trusted name in the internet, uh, Wikipedia, um, gave me um, over 50 famous people and their dates, some of which have expired. They, they were wrong, right? They, they said Jesus was coming uh, this day and this year, and that came and went. Some of these people were Christians, you know, I think exuberant and uh, excited and thinking that maybe they found something in Scripture. Some of these people are leaders of cults who really created a following because they told people, I have the inside track on when Jesus is coming back. And Jesus is coming back now, at this point, and they got a, a following and you know, Jesus didn't come back when they said it. Some of the times are in the future. Um, there, there are a couple people that say 2022, you know, or 2024, or they give a range by 2025, they think Jesus will come, or by 2052, you know. So there's a lot of interest in when Jesus is going to return. There are a lot of people that come up with dates, there are a lot of people that follow, and there's a lot of interest. Well, let me tell you, Jesus is coming back, and let me tell you when. Jesus is coming back on Okay, everyone is watching, looking, no one is looking anywhere else, no one's writing or talking. Look at that just as an example of how tuned in you are to when, when is Jesus coming? I don't have the answer to that, and we're going to find out no one does today in our scripture. But that just shows that we are so focused on the when. When, Jesus? When are you coming back? When are you doing X, Y, Z? God, when are you going to do this? And Jesus says, how about we focus on the what? The what you are to be, the what you are to do now, and not worry about the when. Leave that to the Father. Leave that to the Father. The disciples, though, we're in good company. The disciples did the same exact thing. We're going to see in our passage today that the disciples got so excited. Jesus rose from the dead. He appears to them. They're with Jesus. Jesus is telling them all about the kingdom of God, and they are excited. They say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They are excited. Man, this is it. This is the time. It's now. Isn't it, Jesus? And he redirects them from the when to the what. Today's subject of the sermon is what's next what not when what what's next for the disciples they need to know what's next jesus was about to to ascend into heaven and he tells them what's next you and i have believed in jesus we are convinced those of you that are in christ we are convinced that jesus is the son of god he died he rose again he is the son of god we believe that What's next? Instead of sitting around waiting or wondering or trying to figure out when, Jesus tells us what. So we're going to dig into Acts 1, 1 through 11. We had Jesus, that we celebrated the Lord's Day, the, the resurrection of the Lord. Resurrection Sunday, last Sunday. But I feel like we need to send Jesus back to heaven. He needs, we need to have him ascend because that's the next step in the story. So we're going to spend a couple Sundays on Acts. Today, Acts 1. Next week, we'll be in Acts 2. And so in Acts 1, we're going to see what's next. We're going to focus on three things. There are a lot of things we could focus on this passage, but the three things I'm going to focus on are the Holy Spirit being and doing. The Holy Spirit being and doing. So if you haven't already, turn with me to Acts 1. And as we do, if you are able to stand in honor of God's word as I read, I invite you to stand with me in honor of God's word. Acts 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. 
And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Thank you, Father, for sending us your Son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins and preparing the disciples to carry out your work on earth in your absence. Holy Spirit, thank you for the work that you did in the disciples and through the disciples and for the work you continue to do in us and through us. Pray that you take these words, your holy word, and affect change in us. Transform our minds. Conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. As we read this passage, we learn a couple things. That This is a continuation of Luke's gospel. You know, it's, it's addressed to Theophilus. Theophilus means friend of God. Friend of God. And while that could be a general statement, like this is to all people who are friends of God, it was a common name back in this time. And so it's probably best to think of this as a person. In Luke, he addresses this to most excellent Theophilus. Now in Acts, it's to Theophilus. And some commentators have argued that Theophilus was an official in the government who followed Christ and maybe even lost his title and his position because of Christ. And now he's not most excellent Theophilus. He's simply Theophilus. But at any rate, it's a continuation of the gospel. Luke wrote the gospel. He wrote all these things down. He was a physician. He just put together a detailed account. And now he puts together an account. He says, I told you everything that Jesus did that he wanted to tell them. That led up to his death and resurrection. Now let me tell you, this is a continuation of that. Of that gospel. It's a continuation of the account of the work that Jesus began in his ministry. We're told that Jesus appeared to the disciples over 40 days. He confirmed his resurrection. He strengthened them. He, he taught them. He says he showed them through the scriptures how everything pointed to him from the Old Testament. And then he ordered them to stay in Jerusalem and wait. Wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not many days away. They're excited. These disciples, they were excited. Jesus had risen from the dead. He told them about the kingdom. They're thinking, okay, it's coming, and we're going to be with Jesus. Like He's going to be top dog in charge of everything. We're with him. We're his disciples. They were excited about this happening. So look with me in verse 6 again. I mean, they were excited. They said, Lord! Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, is this our moment? Are we about to experience being with you and in, in your kingdom here? You know, you didn't do it before we get it. You died for our sins. Okay, you explained that. You had to die for our sins. But now, you've done that. So now, let's, re let's restore the kingdom of Israel. Let's do it. Let's do it right now. Jesus rebukes them slightly. He says... It's not for you to know when, right? It's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has established. That's not your job, is to know when that's going to happen. But then he doesn't spend too much time kind of with this slight rebuke. He switches it, but let me tell you some good news. Let me, let me tell you, let me encourage you. Let me strengthen you with this. He tells them what they will be and what they will do. Look with me in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now this verse is rich. When I was in seminary, one of my classes was Bible interpretation. I had it with a man named Howard Hendricks. If you ever heard of Howard Hendricks, they called him Prof. Prof. Hendricks taught over 60 years at the same seminary. Over 60 years. He had 10,000 students learn under him. And he, he would do, he, his first thing he would do in his class, he'd say, okay, observation is what you see. What is in the text? You don't bring things into the text. You look in the text, and the text informs you. But what do you see? What is in the text? What are, you, what are the things that you see here in the text? What does it say? He told us to go home and write down 30 observations from this verse, one verse. We bring them into class. He says, okay, how many of you have 30 observations? We're all, I mean, this is prof, so you work your best for prof. You're like, yes, I got my 30 observations. He goes, all right, don't turn them in yet. Take them home and write down 20 more observations about this passage. Dig in, like just look at it, observe it. And so we had 50 observations at least um, on, this, on this passage. So we're not going to go into all the 30 or the 50 observations that I had from this passage. We'd be here all day. But we are going to focus in on three things. The Holy Spirit, being, and doing. And I think those three things kind of rise up in this passage. First, let's look at the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon the disciples. That's, in, that's interesting. He doesn't say that you will take the Holy Spirit or you will get the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And not kind of brush by you, but you get this sense of fully engulfing the, the, the disciples. It will come upon you. They, they're somewhat passive in this event. And we're going to look at that amazing event next week. But for now, we learn that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon these disciples. The next thing we see is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, there's a result. What are they going to receive? They're going to receive power. When, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples, they're going to receive power. Now, they've been, they've been thinking about power. The, the reality is they've been thinking about the power that they're going to have when Jesus is in charge, and they kind of get ushered into this kingdom that Jesus is in charge of. And there is his men. There is right hand and left hand, and there are the 12 guys that uh, are going to rule with them. 11, they're going to bring one more in here in a little bit, but these disciples are going to step in to that power. And I think they're thinking about this power, but Jesus says, no, you're going to receive power, not when I step into the kingdom right now, and it's not for your, you to know when that's going to happen. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, is this true of us? This is true of them. We know it's true of the disciples. But is it true of us that the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we receive power from the Holy Spirit? Well... Um, we read Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. I read that at, at the beginning when God's word examines our hearts in our, in our passage. And I'm going to read it again. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And we read this, that in him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him. So did you hear the gospel and believe in him, in Jesus? Were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. See, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been given the Holy Spirit as well as a down posit, as a guarantee residing within you, indwelling. Ephesians 3.14 says, For this reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family on earth has been have given, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. In your inner being. So we too, as Christians, have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon the disciples at Pentecost, but he comes and indwells us as well. And what happens when we get the Holy Spirit, he strengthens us as well, spiritually, 
the inner man, our spiritual new creation that we are in Christ. So when the Holy Spirit comes, we receive power. That power is not to rule or have control over people. Just like he told the disciples, it's not for you to rule over people and have position. You're going to have power for something. But what? For what? You're going to have power to be Jesus' witness. You will have power to be Jesus' witness. Look at verse 8 again of Acts 1. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I want to point out something here. There is an emphasis on being before doing. He didn't tell the disciples what to do. He didn't say, okay, you're going to receive power, and I want you to do this, 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 and this, and this. He first defined them as what they were going to be, his witnesses. He says, you will be my witnesses. Now, witnesses witness, so the doing is important. But it's secondary to ontology. That means the being. Being a witness comes first. God creating in you to be the witness, be a witness for him, and then you witness, then you testify. Sometimes we get all wrapped up in the doing as Christians, and we miss the being. When I was in college, I was in a ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ, and I had some uh, older students that when I came in as a freshman, they taught me this little phrase, and I thought it was really cool. It's no do without be. Say it. No do without be. I don't want you to write it down on your bulletin if you can. Write do, and then write the word without. Write the word be. Do without be. Three words right on the bulletin. Then I want you to put an X across it. And that's a little symbol that we came up with. They would write that. And, the, and I had a friend, uh, Melinda Carson. I still remember her. And she would tell me, no do without be. And what she meant, what we meant by that, and what we what we... What we were saying is what this verse is saying. Don't do things out of a sense of duty and obligation and guilt and worry and all of this as a Christian. No. Focus first on being in Christ and let those things be the overflow, the outpouring of who you are in Christ. He doesn't say, go do this, go do this, go do this. No, he says, you will be my witnesses. When the Spirit comes and power is given to you, you will be my witnesses. Now, what will happen? Because you are my witnesses, because you have power, yes, you will testify. You will do something. But it will come as an overflow of the being. Ontology always precedes the practice. We don't want to do anything without authenticity. You know, let who you are Drive what you do. Don't do things to impress other people out of a sense of obligation or guilt. Even here at the church, don't, don't feel guilted into doing things and, and, and an obligation, but let them be an overflow, an outflowing of who you are. John 15, 4 through 5, what does Jesus say? Do you know that passage? Let's turn there. John 15, verse 4. Through five, Jesus says, I am the vine. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We, we sometimes try to force fruit out. You never go up to a tree at night and hear a tree like forcing apples out. No, they don't have to force it. What is fruit? Fruit is the natural expression of the life inside of that tree. It comes naturally. That tree can't help but produce fruit if it's healthy. You and I are to produce fruit, but we don't want to nail apples up onto the tree. We don't want to staple fruit 
onto branches. That's a little silly, isn't it? Go to the store and get a bunch of apples. Your apple tree is not producing. So you go to the store and get apples and just you nail them up or staple them up onto your trees. Hey, look, now my tree has some fruit. But that's what we do with our Christian life. We try to, well, these things would look good. Let me get some of these things. Let me just push it out, work it out. Let me just do these things to try to look good on a sense of duty or obligation or impressing others. No. Abide in Christ. You just stay abiding in Christ. Remain in Him. That means reading God's Word, spending time in prayer, coming here like you're doing. I'm preaching to the choir. You're here in church, but fellowshipping in church. Praising God together, coming and praying together. Those are the things that we, we abide in Christ, confessing our sin to him, asking the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us, depending upon God. As we abide in Christ, we minister as an overflow. Now, I have done it both ways. I have ministered out of an obligation, a duty, and guilt. I have trusted in myself in doing things for the Lord. When I haven't spent time in prayer, when I'm just kind of going off of what I've got in my back pocket, right? Whatever I have, the fumes, the, the spiritual fumes that I have left in the tank. And I've also ministered out of a love for others, out of a love for God, because I've been abiding in Christ, depending upon Him. We receive power from the Spirit. Why? First, to be. To be a witness. The focus is on being, not doing. And as we abide in Christ, we're strengthened by His Spirit. But then comes the doing. Now we have the doing. He says, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit to be my witnesses. And, and witnesses do something. They bear witness. They, they tell the truth. And we bear witness about Jesus Christ. Now, what makes somebody a good witness. Think about it from a court perspective. A, a witness must testify or else they're really not a witness. They, they, they may have been a potential witness, but unless they actually testify, they're not a witness. And I want to remind you to be before you do. I don't want you to have this duty like, I've got to go out and tell people now. No, you're missing the whole point. When we abide in Christ, we are made to be a witness for Jesus. Then we will witness to others. And a witness testifies about the truth. If I could kind of give you a um, takeaway statement, it's this. Be a witness for Jesus to your family, your neighbors, to Montrose, and the world. Be a witness for Jesus to your family, to your neighbors, to Montrose, and the world. And I'm going to give you an ABC of being a witness. A, the first one we've already talked about, Abide in Christ. The first way you are a witness is you abide in Christ. The second one, B, is be credible. C is create a plan. Abide in Christ, be credible, create a plan. And we've already talked about abiding in Christ, but it's the first step of being a witness. Being has to precede the action. No do without be. Read God's word. Fellowship, worship with God's people, depend upon the Holy Spirit to empower and direct you. Now the B, be credible. I looked at de several law websites to talk about, wit to look at witnesses. What made a good witness? You know what? One word rose to the top in looking at a bunch of different websites. It's the word credibility. You want a credible witness. Credibility is what makes sense, is what is important. The National Law Review says, Credibility is the foundational element that enables experts to successfully persuade jurors. Credibility, now this is just a synthesis of other, other um, websites, it says, Credibility is a combination of many things, but it's closely identified with these two characteristics. Trustworthiness and likability. Trustworthiness and likability. The Magnus Research consultants on their website say if either likability or trustworthiness is absent, a witness will have little or no credibility.
So if we are to be witnesses for Jesus, I think it, it makes sense that we are to have trustworthiness and likability. Those two things are true of a witness in a, in a courtroom. They're also true of a witness of Jesus Christ in the world. So being credible means displaying trustworthiness and likability. Are you trustworthy? Are you worthy of trust? Do you have integrity? Are you one with this group, with this group? Are you the same person? Do people know that you're trustworthy, that you're going to be the same regardless of the situation? Are you likable? Being likable means you're not offensive in your demeanor. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are being perishing who are perishing are you the aroma of Christ or do you bring a different kind of aroma wherever you go that just plain stinks and not because you didn't shower but because of your arrogance or being disagreeable so that you drive people away you can't have credibility without being likable first being trustworthy but then being likable Matthew 5, 13, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its taste, how shall it, shall, shall it, <laughs> Susie sells seashells by the seashore. How shall, how shall its saltiness be restored? Now, what does that mean? That you and I are supposed to bring flavor to life. You as a Christian are supposed to be the salt, the thing that brings flavor, that adds something good, that's desirable to be around. You're supposed to be winsome in your speech. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We've got to be witnesses for Jesus. And as becoming a witness for Christ, that's being trustworthy and likable. Having credibility. And then C is create a plan. What did Jesus tell the, the disciples? Start here in Jerusalem. Okay, then go to the next area, Judea and Samaria, which surrounded Jerusalem. And then go out to the end of the earth. To the end of the earth. To every tribe, every people, every nation. We should have a piece of that as our church and individually as well. That we are involved in missions around the world. And we are also start right here. That's why I said start with your family. Who can you better be a witness for Jesus to than your family? Be a witness to your family. Then your neighbors. Spend some time. Spend some money. Go buy some steaks. Unless your neighbor's a vegan. Then go buy some veggie burgers or something that they like. Spend some money and put some effort into it. Show them that you care. Invite them over for dinner. Something that you know they would like. Give of your time, invest your time in getting to know your neighbors. Take walks, stop outside their house, talk to them. Don't, ring, don't linger too long, but just engage in them. Get to know your neighbors. Take those steps. You can't share, you can't be a witness to people you don't know. Have a plan, be intentional, and pray. Pray for them. Pray for them that you'd have opportunities to be a witness. Invite them. Be intentional. Invite them to times that they will hear the gospel and get to interact with the truth. So the sermon title is What's Next? What's next for you? Be a witness for Jesus to your family, to your neighbors, to Montrose, and to the world. Abide in Christ. Be credible. Create a plan. You know, I would not be honest with you if I didn't tell you that there is a cost for being a witness. Do you know the Greek word for witness is the same word that's used for martyr? To be a witness may cost you something. It may cost you popular popularity. It may cost you time, money. It may one day cost you your life. But Jesus said in John 16, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. 
in the world, you will have tribulation. Not everyone is going to be favorably disposed to your witness. We have to remember that when they reject us, as in Luke 10, 16, Jesus says, the one who hears you hears me. And those who reject you reject me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. When we're rejected as a witness for Christ, we remind ourselves they're rejecting Jesus and the Father. And we will have tribulation. But I cut short that verse 16, 33. In this world we will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. But the world right now, while the system of the world is in opposition to us, we have to view the world as, as potential believers in Christ. Yes, that's our opposition, but that's, that's where we're to go. That's to whom we are to be a witness. And it's going to be tough. Not everyone's going to receive that witness. And not everyone is going to be happy and encourage us. There's going to be opposition, and we may lose something. There may be a cost. Eventually, that cost may be our lives. But we are called to be a witness first. Abide in Christ, be credible, create a plan. Now Wednesday, those of you that were here at prayer, we prayed specifically that people would come to this church. That they would come to this church and they would come to seek God, to hear his word, and to hear the gospel. Friday, I got an email from a person who said, can I come to your church I would love for you to show me around and I want you to tell me the beliefs of your church. I said, okay, sure. And he met me here on Saturday. And I was able to share the gospel with him and start from Genesis through Revelation and tell him about the, the, re the redemptive story of Christ. And we prayed that on Wednesday and this guy emails me on Friday and asks to come to the church to hear about the gospel. And part of it, he had a relationship with our family, but he also had been driven, he also driven by the building and saw it and thought he could help out do some things in the building. So you know, God answered that prayer. My point is this. God uses our prayers. He uses our willingness. And then he gives us opportunities as we abide in him. We first abide in him. He creates in us credibility to be a witness. And we have to have a plan. And we have to start where we are and build from there. We have what's next? We are to build the kingdom of God. He works through us. He builds the kingdom through us. Not us on our own. Be a witness for Jesus to your family, to neighbors, to Montrose, and to the end of the earth.